Let's take a look at this model in action. In this example, two experimental treatments were applied to gauge their effectiveness. The plant community prior to weed management was 98% spotted knapweed and 2% cheatgrass. The managers applied two different treatments and got two very different results. In the design disturbance category, they applied a broadleaf herbicide for the first treatment and the second treatment included cultivation and a non-selective herbicide. In the controlled colonization category, the first treatment skipped that category. The second treatment did drill seeding of desirable plant species. In the controlled species performance category, the first treatment did fertilization and the second treatment did early spring grazing. The results of the first treatment were that 95% of the plant community were cheatgrass and bluegrass by the end, and 5% was spotted knapweed. That was a very good reduction of the spotted knapweed from 98%. If it had been their goal to increase the cheatgrass bluegrass, then this would have been a very good treatment. The second treatment, 70% of the species in the plant community were the seeded species, 20% were cheatgrass bluegrass, and 10% were spotted knapweed. As you can see, the results of this model uh, is very different depending on the treatments that you apply. One thing you may not be aware of is the use of soil nutrient depletion to control weed infestation. Let me read some excerpts to help you understand this concept. This excerpt is from the paper Applying Ecological Principles to Wildland Weed Management. There is mounting evidence that site invasion as well as succession, is influenced by soil resource availability. During secondary succession, there is initial increase in nitrogen availability after disturbance, followed by a decline during the later stages of succession. A number of studies have shown that soil disturbance increases nitrogen mineralization, hence increasing nitrogen availability. The work of Tillman and co-workers suggests that succession is driven by the ability of later successional species to reduce soil nitrogen. Frederick and Klein worked with a more arid group of species and also found that later successional species devote more resources to roots compared with early successional species and release more recalcitrant substrates into the rhizosphere, slowing decomposition and increasing nitrogen immobilization, hence reducing available nitrogen in the soil. McLendon and Redente showed that added nitrogen slowed succession and increased the period of dominance by annual species. And from the Shelley, Svikar, and Maxwell paper, there's also discussion of this. Resource availability to plants may be used to influence succession. In some cases, changes in plant communities are related to resource availability and the relative ability of species in the community to extract those resources. To quote Tillman, because each plant species is constrained to being a superior competitor for particular resource levels, the forces that determine resource levels are critically important in determining vegetation patterns. Thus, another potential successional management strategy would be to influence species performance via soil nutrient manipulation. McLendon and Redente demonstrated that additions of nitrogen inhibited succession from annual to perennial species in a sagebrush steppe in northwestern Colorado. They concluded that dominance by annuals during the early stages of secondary succession was related to high nutrient availability. A successional management strategy might be to reduce nutrient availability. The potential of reducing nutrient availability to foster succession has not been adequately explored. Most of the emphasis in nutrient management has been on increasing availability. However, annual cropping systems have been used to reduce nitrate leaching from agricultural fields. It may be possible to use species with demonstrated abilities to sequester nitrogen, such as rye or mid-cereal species, to reduce resource availability. Again from the Svikar paper, If we assume that the available nitrogen influences the potential for site invasion, then we have a relatively large body of knowledge that can be drawn upon to evaluate management decisions. For example, more nitrogen is generally available in grassland soil the year after a drought because uptake by plants is reduced by the drought, whereas microbial activity continues at low soil moisture. Conversely, during wet years, the combination of mineralization and nitrification may not be able to keep up with plant demand, and nitrogen becomes limiting to plant growth. 
The period immediately following a drought may be critical for keeping invasive species from spreading. We also know that nitrogen availability can increase immediately following fire, although that may not always be the case. As you use this model, remember that testing your decisions will be an important key to success. The biological weak link testing question is particularly relevant here. Again, let me turn to Alan Savory's book for supporting information. Now to consider the biological weak link. Consider the question, does this action address the weakest link in the lifestyle of this organism? In the biological context, the weak link test applies when you're dealing with populations of plants or animal organisms that have become a problem, either because there are too many or too few in number. The parasites infecting the farmer's sheep, the loco weed that invades the range, the water hyacinths that choke the hydroelectric plant, the cockroaches that infest the kitchen, or the tortoise or owl threatened by extinction. Whether we see these organisms as friend or foe, the same question is asked and the same logic used. Before any action is taken to increase or decrease their numbers, we need first to ensure that it addresses the weakest link in the organism's life cycle. In doing so, we are likely to maximise the effectiveness of the treatment and to ensure the results will be lasting. Every organism in its life cycle has a point of greatest vulnerability, a weakest link. Recognise this and you have a good chance of inexpensively and effectively increasing or decreasing the ability of that species to recruit new members to its population. When the tool or action addresses that weak link, it passes this test. Finding the weak link in the life cycle of any organism can be quite a challenge. Sometimes the answer is fairly obvious, other times it will require some research. Nature often provides clues that can help because all plants and animals have developed ways to reduce their vulnerability. Most plants, for instance, are most vulnerable during their initial establishment when the seed has germinated and root and leaf must find sustaining conditions in a limited time. Insects and amphibians that produce a mass of eggs would appear to be most vulnerable while still in the egg or larval stages. Far too often we make the mistake of concentrating on the adult members of the species when the adult stage of the life cycle is rarely the point of greatest vulnerability. Thus, whilst we bulldoze mature brush or poison well-established weeds, we're creating favourable conditions for millions of their seeds to germinate and establish. Sometimes we use expensive and dangerous poisons to attack mature insect pests and unwittingly select for new, unscathed and poison-resistant replacements. It's more sensible and more economical to address the invading brush, weeds or insect pests by changing the environment that has become so favourable to their establishment. How will the tools available of rest, fire, grazing, animal impact, living organisms and technology affect the four ecosystem processes relative to that organism's needs at its most vulnerable stage? That's important. Animal impact can be used to help to cover bare ground through trampling down old standing plant material, breaking the capping and compacting the soil to provide seed-to-soil contact so new plants can grow. Living organisms can be enlisted, increasing variety of crops, for example, of hedgerows and tree belts, to increase the diversity of plants on croplands. We have put together a worksheet that you can print out and use in your own planning. To use this worksheet, fill in the data from your biological monitoring on the left-hand side. Then you can circle, highlight, or write in different brainstorming possibilities under each of the three columns. Remember, some treatments can be repeated. To denote repetition, put an R next to your circled treatment. Try different combinations around the table with family or colleagues. Think them through and test your decisions. Experiment with two or three combinations in the field. Monitor the results and decide which resulting plant community best matches the criteria in your holistic goal. This worksheet is available online. Let me tell you how to find it. First, go to Holistic Management International's website at www.holisticmanagement.org. On the left-hand side of the page, you will notice a link that says Free Downloads. Click on this link. This will take you to the Free Downloads section of the Holistic Management website. Scroll down until you see a download entitled Holistic Weed Management Worksheet. Add this worksheet to your cart. At this point, you can proceed to checkout, or you can shop around the Holistic Management store and see if there's anything else you would like to add. We hope that you find this worksheet useful and that you will provide us with some feedback on your experimentation and results.